Welcome to this TEDx event, a part of the global launch of Countdown. We're speaking to you from the sacred territory of the Coast Salish people who have cared for this land for millennia. Hi, I'm Sandy Goldie of BC Drawdown. And I'm Jim Bronson, also of BC Drawdown. And I'm Frances Littman of creativelyunited.org. And here's a brief intro to TEDx. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. This TEDx event is part of the global launch of Countdown, Creative Solutions for a New Decade. Many of the solutions that you'll be hearing about come from the research of over 200 scientists, first published in the 2017 Environmental Book of the Year, Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. This research was updated in 2020 in the Drawdown Review. Drawdown is a partner with Countdown, the global initiative to champion and accelerate solutions to the climate crisis, turning ideas into action. This program is part of the global launch of Countdown, which began on Saturday, October 10th, and will continue for an entire year, leading up to the United Nations COP26 conference in Glasgow, Scotland, November 2021. Sandy, tell me how you came to be so involved with solutions to our current environmental crisis. Jim, I think it started when I was teaching kindergarten, and my favorite unit was the rainforest. I love teaching the kids about the animals and the plants in the rainforest, but I had to tell them the truth, too, that I was really concerned about the destruction of the rainforest that was happening even 25 years ago when I was teaching that. So one day, little Matt came into class and he said, teacher, I'm so excited. I figured out how we can save the rainforest. And I said, that's awesome, Matt, how? And he said, well, he said, I just asked my family if they would give me some money to save the rainforest. And he opened his little fist and showed me a handful of coins. And I said, that's great. Would you tell the other kids about it? So Matt told all the kids about it. And a few fundraisers later, we managed to save three acres of rainforest through the Nature Conservancy. I learned a great lesson from Matt that day that John Lewis articulated really well. When you see something that isn't right, do something about it. Sandy, I, I remember another significant event when you were visiting me down in Ashland, Oregon. Yeah, Jim, that's when I heard about Drawdown for the first time. I saw a poster and I went to that wonderful event that Pachamama Alliance put on at the Grange Hall. And I walked in with about 80 other people who were as worried about global warming at that time as I was. But they were also intrigued because the poster said, we can reverse global warming. So I thought, well, let's find out. By the end of the evening, I was so encouraged that I went up to one of the presenters and said, hey, I would love to bring Drawdown to BC. Would you come up to Vancouver and help me do that? And she said, I love Vancouver, sure. So the rest is history. And you and I have been teaching classes up here ever since. And Jim, one thing I love about teaching with you is that you're a scientist. You got a degree in physics and then another degree in oceanography, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I, I did my research in the Arctic Ocean on an ice island called T3, which moved around the North Pole about every three or four years in a circumpolar circulation. 
I fell in love with that remarkable, beautiful Arctic environment, so pristine, with amazing ice sculptures where ice flows crash into each other. The Arctic, like all oceans, has suffered from global warming and acidification due to absorbing excess CO2. Since 1970, we have lost nearly half of all the vertebrates in the oceans. These are the iconic animals we love and we depend on, fish, whales, sea lions, and porpoises. When you learned about drawdown, I thought, I'm in. Let's help people understand what's happening to our environment and get into action to preserve and protect it. Our oceans are one of Earth's sinks where atmospheric pollution from burning fossil fuels can be absorbed, including the heat caused by greenhouse gas emissions. But the oceans can only safely absorb part of the emissions and the extra heat. It's clear, Sandy. We must reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero and then continue to draw them down to sequester pollution humans have dumped into the atmosphere. All species, including us, depend on it. You're right, Jim. And now we'd like to introduce our friend and countdown partner, Francis Littman. Francis is an international award-winning photographer, community activator, and multimedia producer. Francis is a creative force behind creativelyunited.org, a free community solutions and resource hub, and produces a popular climate and the arts webinar series, in addition to organizing some of Canada's largest zero waste events. She recognizes that we have to be both creative and united to be effective in creating cultural change. Francis, would you tell us what brought you to volunteering thousands of hours to creating a movement? Thank you, Sandy, for that wonderful introduction. I'd love to. After looking through a variety of lenses as a professional photographer from macro to telephoto and being actively involved in community, I came to realize how interconnected everything and everyone is, and more importantly, how healthy, happy communities begin from the ground up. I was absolutely shocked to discover that less than 3% of all charitable giving in Canada goes to the environment, and more than 80% of all fundraising goes to charities focused on cures for diseases. Now, it occurred to me that if we aren't looking after the health of the planet, how can we expect it to look after us? So no wonder cancer is skyrocketing if we're polluting our air, our water, our land, our food, and cutting down our forests and polluting our seas. So I turned my despair into action by using my creative skills and network to create a zero waste Earth Day festival that showcased the underfunded social justice and environmental hero workers in my community. Now I had never done anything like this before. And thanks to all my friends volunteering their time, their skills and their energy, we pulled off a three day zero waste sustainability showcase and arts event with thousands of people in attendance and continued to do so each Earth Day for seven consecutive years. So since 2012, the Creatively United for the Planet, now a nonprofit society, has been leading, convening, and amplifying the public conversation on ways to reduce our ecological footprint and implement long-term sustainability solutions. Through festivals, events, talks, professionally produced films, videos, webinars, creative partnerships, and the free social sharing network, creativelyunited.org, Creatively United for the Planet has brought thousands of people together in person and now online to celebrate and unite those committed to achieving a more socially just and sustainable world. Our mandate is to foster community connections, amplify the meaningful local work community groups are doing, and create collaborative opportunities that bring individuals and organizations together in support of achieving common sustainability goals. Here's a short video which describes what we now offer as a free community solutions and inspirational resource hub at creativelyunited.org.
of like to add that collaborative partners like you, Sandy, and Jim with BC Drawdown can really accelerate great ideas. John O'Reardon of the Gail O'Reardon Climate and the Arts Legacy Series is another. John's late wife, Gail, was a gifted musician and teacher who believed that a major change in human consciousness is required to tackle both the oncoming climate and biodiversity crisis. She also felt that such a change can be assisted by combining climate stories with the performing arts. So working with John and Climate in the Arts, we produce free weekly Wednesday webinars, and I invite you to check them out at creativelyunited.org. These webinars are in line with Gail's values, which include living within nature's limits, transforming our economy to one based on shared values rather than shareholder values, advancing universal consciousness through meditation and self-care, and aligning self-interest with caring for the planet. Now, Dr. Trevor Hancock is another collaborative partner. Dr. Trevor Hancock is a public health physician and recently retired from his position as a professor and senior scholar at the University of Victoria's School of Public Health and Social Policy. In the 1980s, he helped to create the Global Healthy Cities Movement and has been an internationally recognized leader in this area for more than 30 years. In recent years, he has focused on the concept of a one planet community region as a way to integrate the concepts of healthy and sustainable communities. And in retirement, he has started a new nonprofit, Conversations for a One Planet Region, to explore and popularize these ideas locally. Here's Trevor to tell us more. Hello, I'm Trevor Hancock, and I am the founder and president of an organization called Conversations for a One Planet Region. We are based here in the southern part of Vancouver Island, and Victoria is the capital of the Western Canadian province of British Columbia. Now, the problem that we face, that we are, as we understand it, is that we, in fact, not only face climate change, but a whole set of massive and rapid global ecological changes. And the problem is that they are all happening at the same time. Together, they constitute what many people now call the Anthropocene. And this is an existential challenge to our societies. The problem is that we behave in this region as if we had all of this, four whole planets. That's what our ecological footprint is. But we know that in reality, this is all we actually have. And we need to learn how we can live together and have good health for all in this one small planet we share. Now to get to what you can think of as our fair share of the earth means we are going to need a massive and rapid reduction in our ecological footprint and that will mean a whole new way of life. So we need to reach what Will Stefan, one of the leading earth scientists today, has called a social tipping point before we reach a planetary one. And so we're focused on how do we bring about a social tipping point. We think of it as a form of cultural evolution. We have to evolve a new set of values. We have to evolve a new way of life that is more suited to this challenging situation we face. But if we're going to do that, we need to talk about it. If we don't learn and talk about this, we can't understand it. If we can't understand it, we can't begin to imagine either what will happen if we do nothing or a better way of life that we could create for ourselves and our descendants. And if we can't imagine it, we can't design and create it. So we are very much focused on that process of talking to each other, of conversations, preferably face to face, but with COVID nowadays online. But we're also thinking of things such as kitchen table conversations, study circles, neighborhood co-design workshops or charrettes, and ultimately perhaps even a one planet folk school that will help recreate a culture of public learning, as was done in the Nordic countries in the 20th century. So those are some of the ways we're approaching this enormous challenge. And in the next hour, we're going to be talking to some of the people we work with about how they too are trying to bring about this massive cultural evolution by talking with each other and presenting new ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. Now I'd like to introduce Patrick Kelly. Patrick Kelly is a member of the Le Camel First Nation, Stalo Nation in British Columbia, Canada, and a highly respected Indigenous cultural advisor. 
He operates a private consulting business providing services in economic, community, and organizational development, governance, planning, and management, and is an active community volunteer with the Victoria Foundation, a governor with the Law Foundation of BC, co-chair of the Bant Centre Indigenous Program Council, International Advisory Board Member of University of Victoria's Gustafson School of Business, and a Chinook Indigenous Advisory Board Member, as well as the University of British Columbia Saunders School of Business, and the founding president of the BC Aboriginal Golf Association. Patrick has held executive and management roles with the Canadian Executive Service Organization, the Missing Women's Commission of Inquiry, and Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, amongst many others. Welcome, Patrick. I'm from a culture, the Stalo people, that have been in the place that we call uh, the Stalo Nation, which is uh, around the Fraser Valley, uh, just east of Vancouver. Uh, we've been around our territories for about 500 generations. And when we think about the history of Canada, uh, Canada, even if we go back to um, the, the time when King George III took possession of North America after the Seven Years' War, um, Canada has been in existence for about eight generations. And that's about the same time as, uh, you know, the, one of the greatest um, influences on the world's economy, the thinking and the structure of the world's economy, Adam Smith. Both Canada and Adam Smith's thinking came in at about the same time. So a lot of the indigenous philosophies and thinking has been in place for, you know, 15,000 years. And Canada has been in place for about uh, almost 150 years. So, you know, I think uh, there's a lot to be learned from the uh, First Nations and Indigenous traditions as we go forward and try to work together to help improve the well-being of Mother Earth and, uh, and of all peoples, really. If you think that for the 500 generations that the Stalo have uh, lived in the area that we now call the Fraser Valley, for example, um, you know, along with the, uh, the thinking of the Stalo was this very important principle called Shwili. And Shwili is a foundation principle that basically says that everything is interconnected. And it's not only the Stalo, if you look at the, uh, the Nuchanath people, they developed and followed the concept of Hishuk Tsawak, that everything is one, everything is connected. The Naklapmuk people developed and followed the concept of Tekem Shuknukwa, connectedness. And I've heard very similar concepts described in Blackfoot, in the Maori, the Celtic, the Saxony, and many other indigenous uh, traditions from other parts of the world. And as human beings, um, and we have the capacity to know and understand what is right. We also have the ability and the capacity to act on what we believe to be right. And so we've de demonstrated repeatedly that we have a strong tendency to do just that. And I think one of the, the challenges before us today in the political economy in particular, and as it affects the environment and the well-being of people, the well-being of our social structures and our political structures, is that, um, you know, before the generations to come uh, after us, I think we need to really rethink and retool the approaches that we take on the economy and, and how things can get better. You know, I think if we, uh, if we add to the principles of the free market, um, you know, growth and, um, and prosperity, I think we also need to make sure that alongside those go the principles of, you know, economic well-being, cultural well-being, social well-being, and also the spiritual aspects, because, you know, we're all spiritual beings uh, in, in this world. And uh, Mother Earth is a place where we all live, and it's a, it's a very important connection that we have for our lives. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, as, as human beings working together, when we take into account more 
than just the economic factors. We have to take into account uh, cultural factors, environmental factors, social factors, and the spiritual factors. I think those are the challenges before us. And if we don't get a handle on those, uh, you know, we're going to be leaving uh, the same challenge generation after generation for all the people that follow us. So I think it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us to try to get this right so that uh, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and the many generations to come actually have a better place and a better way to get along in the world uh, where we all share equitably in the wealth and in the, the well-being of, of Mother Earth. Thanks so much, Patrick. Now I'd like to give us a look at what's at issue with human-induced global warming. On this chart, you can see global temperature change on the left going up and the years going by on the right. And you can see in about 1950, we started global warming. And we're currently on a trajectory that goes up toward 1.5 Celsius. The scientists tell us if we can stay in this dark green envelope, we have a chance of avoiding the most catastrophic consequences of global warming. Most of us are getting quite clear about the urgency of the climate crisis. Where Jim has a home in Ashland, Oregon, half the school children in two neighboring towns became homeless during the recent fires. When I was in Ashland a couple of years ago and heard about drawdown, I was thrilled to know that there was a path forward. So just to be clear, we do have enough solutions. They just need to be ramped up and scaled up and made worldwide. Okay. Drawdown Review of 2020 has three categories for climate change. Reduce greenhouse gas sources. The second one, support greenhouse gas sinks, uplifting all of nature's way of dealing with greenhouse gases. The third one, improve society fostering equality for all of us. So one of the most effective ways to fight global warming is to reduce food waste. And another one that we can all do in our families is to adopt a plant-rich diet. Educating women particularly, but education in general, and then having women have access to family planning is a huge way to fight climate change. And one that's near and dear to us in British Columbia is forest protection. Here we see the Great Bear Rainforest, a source of tremendous sequestration of carbon dioxide and equivalents. What would the future look like if we simply embrace the solutions that already exist today? Here's a model that gives us a look at the future. You can see that Kate Rayworth, with her regenerative circular economy, or so-called donut economy, says that we can live in the green area that's within this donut. To do so, we must avoid the ecological ceiling. We must avoid climate change, ozone layer depletion, etc. All of the things around the outside of the donut. And we must overcome the problems of shortfalls, lack of good water, lack of food, lack of education. And so Kate proposes that we, in all together in the world, we can have a safe and just space for humans to live in. And at creativelyunited.org, you can watch a video on the circular economy or donut economy at Wildwood. Maybe this slide is very complex, but I just want to focus on the fact that there are solution accelerators, and they've been modeled so that between now and the, our future generations, we have an opportunity to bring these accelerators up and move solutions forward at a more rapid and effective pace. So just for a second, look at the dark yellow. And at the top of the dark yellow box, we see fossil fuel subsidies eliminated. We also see carbon pricing in most markets. Those are examples of solution accelerators that can be very effective in returning our Earth to sustainability. Another solution accelerator is simply to take your money out of fossil fuel projects. I've already changed banks because I discovered my bank was one of the worst supporters of fossil fuels. And at this time, the universe is clearly telling us 
vote, vote your values, vote for people that love and want to restore the earth and natural processes. The Drawdown Review in 2020 gave us 10 key insights. The first one, we can reach drawdown at least by mid-century if we scale the climate solutions already in hand. And the second is climate solutions are interconnected as a system and we need all of them. Beyond addressing greenhouse gases, climate solutions can have co-benefits that contribute to a better, more equitable world. The financial case in favor of many climate solutions is crystal clear, as savings significantly outweigh the costs. The majority of climate solutions reduce or replace the use of fossil fuels. We must accelerate these solutions while actively stopping the use of coal, oil, and gas. And aren't we glad that Harbor Air in Vancouver has had the first commercial route using an electric plane starting last November? We cannot reach drawdown without simultaneously reducing emissions towards zero and supporting nature's carbon sinks, all those trees and water that just absorb the carbon. Some of the most powerful climate solutions receive comparably little attention, reminding us to widen our lens. Accelerators are critical to move solutions forward at the scale, speed, and scope required, like having lots more charging stations for electric cars. And there are things we can all do at every level to advance climate solutions. It will take immense commitment, collaboration, and ingenuity. That's what will be necessary to leave the path we're on and do what's needed. We can do that, can't we, Jim? Absolutely. Jim, our next speaker is Guy Dauncey. I am a big fan of his. We are so lucky to have Guy Dauncey, a leading authority on climate change with us to share five tips. He's got a lot to say, so I would suggest you visit thepracticalutopian.ca and watch some of the videos that we've had with Guy on creativelyunited.org. Take it away, Guy. Well, thank you, Francis. And um, it's, it's a really important, critical time. We're in the most critical decade, I believe, since the beginning of civilization. And we really need to understand this thing. So what I have are not five tips, but five really solid, substantial solutions. On the climate and ecological emergencies, what can we do? The little quote says, be sure to wash your hands and all will be well. But behind COVID, we've got these massive other problems that are sort of fighting to get attention. Just looking at Greta's face tells us what younger people are feeling about what's happening in the world and how urgent the need for action is. The last time the world was three degrees warmer, which is where we're heading by the end of this century, the sea level was 25 meters higher. And this is Vancouver with just a five meter sea level rise. It wipes out the whole industrial you know, transportation core of the city, the airport, the docks, everything. Huge, huge problem to be concerned about. I've been active on this file for 20 years, writing my first book on solutions to climate change in 2001, my second book in 2009, a major paper on what the federal government can do in February of this year, and a major paper on what the provincial government can do just last week, called 50 Ways to Bring More Urgency to BC's Climate Action Plans. But the five critical themes are, one, we need urgent wartime mobilization. We need a clear, positive vision of the future. The technology is ready, that climate is a double challenge, and that citizen mobilization is essential. So starting with the top one, we need urgency from government and a sense of determination and the organization that goes with it and the finance needed to back that up. That means specifically, we need to form crown corporations to lead the many necessary changes from making electric vehicles, making heat pumps, retrofitting homes and all that stuff. We need to regulate for a steady transition to 100% renewable energy for all purposes by 2040. We need to guarantee secure income and a route to a new work for all fossil fuel workers. We need to use the powers of public banks and central banks to finance the transition. And we need to mobilize and train 5% of the nation's citizens to become climate leaders. Number two, the technology is ready. This is a small electric car selling in China right now for 4,000 US dollars, not 24,000 or 54, but just 4,000. And they sold, you know, instantly demands for 50,000 appeared. We need to require all new cars to be electric by 2025 or 2030. Norway is saying 2025. Germany, Denmark, Iceland, Ireland, those countries are saying by 2030, not 2040, which is the current BC goal and the federal government has no goal at all in Canada. We need to require all new buildings to be passive house designed by 2022. We know how to build them. They don't cost anything more. They have no energy heating bills whatsoever. They, they need no gas or oil heating. 
why wait under the current rules in British Columbia until 2032? It's just a, a signal that there's no hurry, there's no worry, there's no urgency. Look at the falling cost of solar. It's 300 times cheaper over the past 40 years. We need to require all trucks to be electric by 2040, which is now California's current legislation. And there are innovations happening in shipping, in aviation, in, in the making of steel, and all sorts of other industrial realms that can encourage the transition to 100% renewable energy. Theme number three, we need a positive vision of a sustainable future. We've had a transition before, you know, we've moved from horses to cars, it happened. We can do this transition again, this is New York, both of these images are from New York, from fossil fuel cars to electric vehicles, transit, electric bikes, walking, rethinking our cities. It's just a transition, why would we not want to do this? It was fossil fuels that made science engineering, solar PV and electric vehicles possible. The age of fossil fuels has been the launch ramp for the solar age. We spent 300,000 years getting our solar energy through firewood. Then we spent 300 years getting it from fossilized solar energy. And now we're entering a billion years when we'll get it from solar, solar energy, getting it directly. What's not to love about this kind of transition? With every passing year, solar energy technology gets better and cheaper and more efficient. We need to leave the fossil fuels in the ground, end all coal mining by 2025, end all extraction of natural gas by 2040, end all extraction of oil by 2040, and make these regulated, legislated goals. We need to thank the fossil fuel workers for the incredibly hard, dirty work they've done and welcome the solar age. My fourth theme is that climate is a double challenge. Very few people understand this. In addition to going to 100% renewable energy and eliminating all climate pollution, we need to have a carbon drawdown of the surplus in the atmosphere. We have 300 gigatons of surplus heat trapping carbon. We'll continue trapping heat even if we move to 100% renewable energy. We need a second set of goals and policies to restore those 300 gigatons back to earth through changed forestry, changed farming, changed ranching, changed ocean management and things like that. The movie Kiss the Ground, currently on Netflix, is a really good exploration of the way changes in farming can achieve this. And ecoforestry, we need a nationwide shift to ecosystem-based forestry, phasing out clear cutting, phasing out the use of timber for pulp and paper, and the permanent protection of all remaining ancient forests, which store far more carbon than other forests. And five, we need citizen mobilization. In Britain during World War II, victory would not have been possible without millions of people who volunteered to join the Red Cross, the YMCA, the Women's Voluntary Service, the St. John's Ambulance Brigade, Oxfam, and the Home Guard, which by June 1940 had one and a half million volunteers. Our equivalent today is that every city of a million people would need 50,000 climate leaders, 5% of the population, who would volunteer to eliminate the climate pollution from their household heat and transportation within two years to become climate block captains to help their neighbors do the same and to mobilize for greater climate pressure on governments. This piece has been singularly lacking from all climate plans from any government so far. We need to dream it, plan it and do it because the urgency is enormous. I've written a whole novel laying out what the, this kind of future can look like to get us inspired about this future and fall in love with the future. And there's my website, thepracticalutopian.ca. Wow, thanks so much, Guy. Now. I'd like to introduce Seth Klein. He's the former BC director of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, a public policy research institute committed to social and economic justice. These are some of the World War II posters in Seth's book, which show the I can do it spirit, the we can do it spirit that we need now. So as the title suggests, I am convinced that to confront the climate emergency, a wartime approach is needed and moreover, that our wartime experience should be embraced as a hopeful story. There's no small irony in me coming to this place. And like many of you, I'm sure I too wrestle with the war analogy. I cut my political teeth in the peace movement. I am the child of Vietnam War resistors. That's in fact how I happen to be Canadian. Um, but I am now strongly of the view that climate breakdown requires a new mindset to mobilize all of society, galvanize our politics, and to fundamentally remake our economy. And here's why. Despite decades of calls to action, our greenhouse gas emissions are not on a path to stave off a horrific future for our children and future generations. The chart tracks Canada's GHG emissions going back to the year 2000. And what is evident is that in the face of the defining challenge of our time, our politics are not rising to the task at hand. I invite you to let this deeply disturbing chart just sink in. And then let all of us agree that what we have been doing is simply not working. We have run out the clock with distracting debates 
about incremental changes, but where it matters most, actual GHG emissions, we have accomplished precious little. Now you might look at this and say, well, at least things are more or less flatlined, our emissions are no longer rising, but as the great climate change warrior and founder of 350.org, Bill McKibben has said, winning slowly on climate change is just another way of losing. Politics might be all about compromise and the art of the possible, but there's no bargaining with the laws of nature, and nature is now telling us something fierce. I'll, I'll read a, a little bit from the preface. This project began as an exploration of how we can align our politics and economy in Canada with what the science says we must urgently do to address the climate emergency, and it is that. I had always planned to include a chapter on the lessons of the Second World War, but as I delved into that work, I began to see more and more parallels between our wartime experience and the current crisis, and ultimately decided to structure the entire book around lessons from Canada's Second World War experience. Not because I get all weirdly animated about war, rather is because I see in the history of our wartime experience a helpful and indeed hopeful reminder that we have done this before. We have mobilized in common cause across society to confront an existential threat, and in doing so, we have retooled our entire economy twice in the space of two short years, a few short years. Now, I'm not the first person to say that we need a wartime scale mobilization, but usually this comparison is made as a passing reference. Until now, no one has, in the Canadian context at least, delved into the similarities and lessons in detail. Here's one important comparison I make right near the beginning, and one that gives me some hope, and it's this. Despite Canada's war declaration in September of 1939, it's worth recalling that even as the winds of war gathered in the late 1930s, our leaders were reluctant to recognize what would ultimately be necessary. A lot like today. Canada was on the cusp of being completely transformed by its Second World War experience, yet right up to the 11th hour, our government still hoped to avoid getting dragged into that fight. And so we find ourselves today in this similar awkward period in July last summer, Justin Trudeau's government passed a climate emergency motion in the House of Commons and then proceeded with reapproving the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion the very next day. That is the new climate denialism at play. But as with the Second World War, this phony war will not last. I'm convinced that it is about to end. The book is an invitation to our political leaders to reflect on the leaders who saw us through the Second World War and to consider who they want to be and how they wish to be remembered as we undertake this defining task of our lives. My hope is that this book will embolden them to be more politically daring than what we have seen to date, because that's what this moment demands. And much like the trials that tested the character of past generations, the book is also an invitation to all of us to reflect on who we want to be as we together confront this crisis. So that's a bit from the book's preface. In the first chapter, just to give you a teaser, I, I share what I see as some key lessons from the Second World War, which I dub the Battle Plan for Climate Mobilization. It's a 14-point plan outlining what it looks like to adopt an emergency mindset and do what it takes to win. Much of the book deals with the connections between climate action and inequality and argues for why linking these crises is central to winning. As you read the book, my hope is that you will marvel, as I did while researching and writing it, at the scale and scope and speed of what Canada did during the war years, and that you will find inspiration that we are capable of once again accomplishing something amazing, and that we can do ourselves proud, and like then, that we can come out the other end of this transformation, not only with a safer environment, but with a better and more just society than the one we are leaving behind. Our sense of what is possible is contained by what we know. And my hope is that with this exploration of what we did the last time we faced an existential threat, that that can serve to just blow open our sense of political and transformative possibility. Like many of you, as I read the latest scientific warnings and as I look out my window, I'm afraid. In particular, I feel deep anxiety about the state of the world we are leaving to those who will live out through most of this century and beyond. All of us, who take seriously these scientific realities, wrestle with despair. The truth is that we don't know if we're gonna win this fight, if we will rise to this challenging time. But it's worth appreciating that those who rallied in the face of fascism 80 years ago, likewise, didn't know if they would win. We often forget that there was a good chunk of the war's early years during which the outcome was far from certain. Yet that generation rallied regardless, and in the process, surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving. Thanks, Seth. We're reading your book right now, and we love it. 
You're right, Sandy. It's been great to read together. And one of the things that points me toward the youth panel that's ending this program is this last piece from Seth. He says, all war stories have their protagonists, villains, victims, naysayers, and delayers. In these next 10 years, we will all need to be climate heroes. Whoever we are and whatever our role, will we be able to look young people in the eyes years from now and say with assurance and pride that when fate called, like those before us, we took up the call. Now let's look at three leaders who are doing important things on a local level. When it comes to community climate heroes, Jane Devonshire is well-deserving of a recent Victoria Community Leadership Award and many others. Welcome, Jane. You are one of the most dedicated community organizers and activators that I know. What words of advice would you like to share with our audience? Thank you, Frances. I would really like people to know that anyone can make a big difference at their local community level. If change isn't coming from the top down, then let's make it happen from the bottom up. A huge portion of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from urban centers, and we can take a big bite out of that. And there is nothing more powerful than a room full of constituents to move a council. So here's a bit of a background to my work. It started out when I first heard about Bristol and London, England declaring climate emergencies. I was so excited by this, and I immediately wanted to lobby our councils to do the same. So I helped form the View Royal Climate Coalition, we presented to council asking them to declare a climate emergency. Well, we were so exhilarated when they passed this resolution and had it embedded in the strategic plan as a priority. So I'm also a volunteer with Dogwood, a provincial nonprofit organization whose mission is to help local people organize to win back control of their environment, energy, and democracy. So I reached out to some of my contacts and we successfully launched ECO, the Esquimalt Climate Organizers. Esquimalt Council followed suit. And uh, so buoyed by these successes, I decided to reach out to other climate action teams that I could find in the South um, Island. And if there weren't any, I tried to find people that I could help start a team. Some of the um, more progressive councillors caught wind of this and even funneled people to me. So that was pretty awesome. So that's how SICAM was formed. SICAM is the South Island Climate Action Network. We meet monthly, share ideas, and strategize on how to move the dial on climate action. We unite when we need to amplify our collective voice. And we are now represented in 11 out of the 13 municipalities in the region, which is pretty awesome. So our current role is to continue to advocate for strong climate action. Our approach is collaborative and non-combative. We find that this approach garners us much success and respect and recognition from the council. So together, we can make that difference. Agreed. Well, well done, Jane. And tell us some of your recent campaigns. Okay, well, right now we're focusing on pushing for retrofits. That's replacing oil and gas furnaces with clean energy saving heat pumps. Um, the 100% electrification of our transit system and making it mandatory for new bills to have EV charging stations ready. Wow, that's great. And what can, what can I do? What can one person do? Well, you're doing a lot, Francis, but everyone needs to step up to be part of the solution to combat climate change. We need a collective consciousness to succeed. Um, and besides that, I love meeting all these invigorating, inspired, passionate, wonderful people. Uh, it helps me sleep at night, and it keeps that negative mind chatter at bay. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you yes. so much, Jane, because I didn't think you ever slept. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ditto. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Francis. Thank you. The district of Saanich, with a population of around 120,000 people, is the largest municipality in the Greater Victoria region, here on the southern end of Vancouver Island, on Canada's west coast. In 2017, Saanich became one of five municipalities around the world to pilot a One Planet Cities initiative organised by the UK-based Bioregional. Bioregional have been pioneering One Planet Living approach for almost 20 years from their headquarters in Bedzed, a sustainable and healthy development they created in South London. 
After a career as a science writer and publisher, president of a community association and a term on council, Fred Haynes became mayor of Saanich in 2018. He's been a strong supporter of the One Planet Saanich initiative. Mayor Haynes, can you tell us why you support this initiative and what it means for Saanich and other municipalities? Thank you very much, Trevor, for the opportunity. Uh, the One Planet model is an essential ingredient for any uh, municipality trying to reach out to the population that it's responsible for and engage them in addressing lifestyles such that we can reduce our planetary consumption from three or four planets to one planet. Um, uh, in terms of climate change, which is a parallel uh, crisis, we have some excellent uh, climate action plans. But to save the planet, and we only have one, and it's the one we're living on, we need to address a far broader range of ecological imperatives, our food supply, our energy supply, how we live with wastes, etc. And ultimately to make us happier residents on the planet. Um, through the One Planet model, we've been able to engage with businesses, schools, faith-based groups, other stakeholders to yield changes in uh, our residents' behavior to reduce their planetary impact. We can't do it alone. We're trying to reach out to have a one planet region, a one planet island, and we've been working with the Union of British Columbia to bring it forward as a provincial um, objective. So um, if we're going to really uh, uh, mobilize all the resources that are gonna be required, we need to engage our, our residents. No government, whether it's municipal, provincial or federal, can do it alone. And the One Planet model has a toolkit ready online that's able to engage immediately, and I believe is, is going to be a very successful formula. Um, we've proven it here over two years in Saanich, and I'm very hopeful that um, our neighbors and uh, others will start to look to the One Planet model as the solution to um, basically saving the planet. Megan Curran is a climate champion on the Municipal Council in the District of North Vancouver a member of the Deep Cove Community Association and also of Ocean Ambassadors Canada. She has been a leader in the formation of the Canada-wide Climate Caucus, an organization of over 250 elected officials across Canada. The Climate Caucus Counselor's Handbook is a valuable resource for all communities to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis in the most effective ways possible through well-designed policies. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Curran. Thanks for having me. I'm a counselor in the district of North Vancouver and I'm on the steering committee for Climate Caucus. And Climate Caucus is a nonpartisan network of local elected leaders. So those are mayors, counselors, and regional directors working um, collectively to create and implement equitable policy which aligns with the IPCC and the um, IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems Services. I'm on the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And today is Orange Shirt Day, and I want to honor the residential school survivors, their families, and those who did not survive. By way of background, the District of North Vancouver declared a climate and ecological emergency in July of 2019, and that was really to recognize that humanity faces these two interconnected planetary crises, global heating and ecological collapse, um, biodiversity collapse, which are of course um, connected um, and actually exacerbating one another, and both symptoms of this extractive exploitive system. The West, the um, IPCC is certainly um, better known, not as well known as we'd like um, in the general public, of course, but the um, IPBES, which is, again, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, I'm just going to keep saying it, um, is really critical um, and needs to be foundational to the work at all levels of government. Um, the 2019 um, UN scientists sounded the alarm by warning that more than 1 million species faced extinction. In the UN Global Assessment uh, Report, there was a, a quote that really stood out that I'll share. So it's not too late 
to make a difference, but only if we start now at every level from local to global. By transformative change, we mean a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. So that systems-based approach really informs the work that I do in the District of North Vancouver and with Climate Caucus. And I wanted to just briefly share some of the work that we are, um, that we have in progress. So this is the um, Councillor's Handbook, which is a toolkit for elected leaders and their allies to take action on climate change. It is um, still in draft form and it is a living document, so it will be um, changing over the time. But this was written by local elected leaders for local elected leaders. Um, with support from our allies. And its purpose is to provide our members with inspiration, resources, um, sample motions and reports, and sustained support to transform our communities um, into becoming the equitable, regenerative, decarbonized, and resilient communities we know they can become um, in this transform um, decade of transformation. So um, this document uh, really goes through the um, steps that we recommend for local uh, electeds to take. And so we're certainly welcome other allies to look at this and maybe to bring these forward to your local councils as um, actions that you'd like to see in your um, municipality. So step one is to recognize the climate, ecological, and humanitarian emergency. And um, we would um, suggest that you then say that you're going to align um, with the IPCC and the IPBS science and um, adopting the change framework, which I'll touch on briefly um, in a moment, set your visions and targets and establish a 1100 committee. Um, 1100 is our 10 year mission um, that stands for one planet, 10 years, no one left behind. Um, and so we would uh, establish, establishing a committee is a way to ensure that um, there's accountability for the steps that you're um, committing to. And the step five, take action. We've gone through transportation, buildings, zero waste, nature-based solutions, and food security, and provided a lot of resources, um, examples of things that are happening in other local governments um, and, and around the world. Um, for inspiration. So I don't have time to go into too much um, detail with this, but I just wanted to um, point this out. And then the change framework um, really is a way for, um, we ca we're calling it a power tool for creating change. Um, it's a way to operationalize um, the strategic vision. It helps counselors set um, and explain goals and priorities. And um, it really becomes a decision matrix um, that every decision um, can filter through. So the um, we have been working with Dr. Astrid Brussel at the University of Victoria on a pilot project using the planetary health framework. And there's other great frameworks out there, um, EcoCity, the City Donut, um, which just launched in Amsterdam um, on a city scale. One Planet Sandwich is um, really inspiring the work that has been happening there. The SDGs, um, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, have been implemented by some Canadian um, municipalities. So again, um, 1100 is really an overarching framework, um, a simple statement of what we're striving for, the urgency of the task, and the moral imperative that we do this together. So we share a single finite planet, we have a single decade to act, and that action without justice is no one at all. So that's the zero, um, no one left behind. So thanks again for having me and um, look forward to um, connecting with you all. Thanks. Wow, those are some great initiatives. Thank you all. Did you know that trees offer us protection against climate change and are one of the most helpful and cheapest urban water and pollution management strategies available? Trees not only help prevent flooding by sucking up the water and reducing the intensity, but they absorb airborne pollutants, reduce asthma, provide cooling shade and shelter, and homes for birds and animals, plus beauty for us all to enjoy, and some of these other many benefits. 
Trees are amazing. Creatively United is so grateful for trees that we produced this short clip as an introduction to a film we produced in partnership with a professional dance company to bring attention to the forest in an innovative way. For the love of our home, we are taking a stand. We are a tribe, we are a tribe, awakening, listening to the heartbeat of a new birth. Earth is you, Earth is me, we're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. Now, we'd like you to meet two fellow tree lovers who are great examples of what individuals can do when passion meets action. One of the two northernmost Gulf Islands, two ferry rides away from Vancouver Island, is Hornby Island, a haven of beautiful beaches and forests inhabited by less than 2,000 full-time inhabitants, but visited by hundreds of thousands each year. Rebecca Carey, a conservationist and professional tree planter, teamed up with Grant Scott, a retired forester, to undertake the goal of planting 10,000 trees in less than six months on Hornby Island and other Gulf Islands. Seeing the steady decline of native cedars and alders in the past 10 years and knowing that it takes at least 10 years for a new tree to become carbon, a carbon sink, Rebecca founded Trees for Tomorrow, a grassroots movement to purchase seedlings and get them into the ground. Here's a short one minute clip. My generation got a monstrous benefit out of everything the environment and the resources in our country has to offer. We got that benefit. And you, you kind of get to a point in your life where you want to put as much back in as you can, right? When I heard that the Conservancy of Pahornby Island was initiating this Trees for Tomorrow program, uh, because trees hang onto the carbon, they store it, and it is a way that we can help climate change, I thought, yes! This Earth Day, do something good for the planet and help us fight climate change by supporting the Trees for Tomorrow project. I got a 13-year-old grandson and I got my daughters and I, you know, I want to hopefully leave this place in good stead for them. My name is Shelley and I support the Trees for Tomorrow project. Absolutely. Rebecca, tell us where are you with your goal and how are you doing this so quickly? Well, so far we've already planted 3,500 trees on Hornby Island and our goal for October is to plant another 10,000. So we're really on our way to planting 10,000 trees in 2020. We'll probably exceed that goal. And the long-term goal of the project is to keep doing this every single year, 10,000 trees, and we have no real plans of stopping. There's just two of us tree planters that are planting the trees right now. We'll probably welcome more volunteers. And yeah, a small group of uh, professional foresters, environmentalists, tree planters is really what's making this project so uh, easy to do and successful. So Rebecca, how can people support you? Every tree that we're planting is essentially donated. So anyone can go to our website, anywhere in Canada, anywhere in the world really. Um, if you go to our website, $2 donated, plants a tree and it's amazing especially if you live on um, the Gulf Islands or the Salish Sea coastal region it's right in your backyard it's a really fantastic initiative yeah for two dollars you can make a difference absolutely so please check out Rebecca's website trees for tomorrow and plant a tree thank you Rebecca thank you Meet a tree lover whose deep childhood connection with Mother Earth has taken this mother of four on a mission to not only pay for and plant 2,500 sequoia seedlings and 600 other varieties of more common BC trees since 2019. Susan Bibbings from Vancouver, BC is the founder of sequoiasolution.org. 
She believes that planting a tree is equally as healing to humans as healing our relationship with Mother Earth and is just as important as the carbon sequestration that trees offer. Welcome, Susan, and thank you for your incredible enthusiasm in planting needed trees. I understand you are a self-taught tree researcher who looks at tree planting with a hundred year plan, and that's why you chose to plant mostly sequoia trees. Can you tell us how and where and why you do this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Sequoia Solution is, uh, is an initiative that um, I've started with a group of other local people, which is really an initiative centered around healing. Um, not only healing our planet Earth, but also healing the human beings in the process with something that is such a simple act, the act of planting a baby tree that's something so simple even a child can do. Watching our climate crisis unfold, I really um, wanted to try and find a way to empower not only myself, but other people in what seems to be such a large overwhelming problem. And what is it, what is something that one person can do to affect some change? And that really brought me to tree planting. So Susan, you, I've heard you say, if you love something, you can't harm it. And loving trees goes way back to our indigenous elders, the wisdom, the teaching, and, and they, you know, it's been said, first plant a tree, then a garden. So a lot of people think sequoias are so big and scary, but you know, can you talk to that? Like, why did you choose sequoias? As Canada, is heating at, at twice the global average and our precipitation is way down here. We are um, uh, unfortunately suffering a mass diet of our iconic Western red cedar trees here. So it just occurred to me that it only makes sense to be planting trees that are gonna be better suited to survive in a, in a hotter climate. And so the sequoias um, really are an, a, a fantastic choice for that reason. Um, not only are they drought resistant and wildfire resistant, but they, they thrive in, a, in the slightly warmer climate. They're just really incredible. They, they can survive up to 3,000 years, and they're also some of the very tallest trees in the world. And because they're a bigger tree, do they sequester more carbon? They do. They, they really are the rock stars of carbon sequestration. They can sequester up to 3.5 metric tons, and that's every single year, and lock it down. But if someone doesn't have a very big space to, to plant these, how, what do you suggest? Well, you know, um, I'm really not finding any shortage of places to plant these trees because um, in existing forests with our cedars dying out, it makes an excellent um, tree to replace the ones that we're losing. And also just a simple walk through the woods and you'll, you'll notice there's so many opportunities and so many little pockets in an existing forest that can easily accommodate a a sequoia here and there. And do you have any pushback from like municipal councils or c communities? Like, like how, how do you go about this? Do you have to do it under the cover of darkness? It, it is a guerrilla gardening um, activity, but um, I, uh, I work with the blessing um, of the First Nations uh, whose unceded territory I'm blessed enough to live on. So um, it's under their authority that, um, that I do the planting. And are you tracking these trees in any way? Yeah, so this is kind of an, an, an interesting aspect to it. Um, uh, we, we photograph every single tree that we plant, and in doing so, we're able to um, uh, extract the GPS coordinates of the exact location where we have planted the sequoia, and that way we can follow them, um, water them, and also provide an opportunity for people who are unable to plant, maybe from different parts of the world, um, can adopt one of our trees. And then we send them a beautiful postcard where we write the GPS coordinates of each individual tree. So a person is able to adopt a specific tree on the planet. And people just love that concept. And then I gather that um, like you walk around potentially with seedlings everywhere you go. Is this how it works? And you pop these into pockets of pre-existing forests or you use stumps? Is that right as a nurse tree? It has become a little bit of, of an obsession. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Often um, you'll find my children rolling their eyes as I say, oh, there's a good spot for one. Oh, I could probably fit two in there. 
And is that information on your website so that other people who are interested in planting trees can find out more? Absolutely. We have uh, a website and we're also on Instagram and Facebook. And people can also um, fill out our volunteer planting form if they would like to be involved in that capacity. People can adopt uh, a tree and, and really give a very meaningful gift to someone knowing that they've helped to plant another sequoia. This is, of course, particularly relevant with our uh, wildfires in California, which um, tragically have burned uh, many, many acres of trees and sequoias. So it's even more timely now to be helping to um, plant and start life going on some new sequoias. Good for you, because I would think that those other sequoias, even if they survive, they're severely compromised. So good on you for planting new sequoias. And one last piece of advice for anyone wanting to do this, what do you say? Well, I, I think the, they say the very best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, and the second best time to plant is today. So <laughs> get out there and do it. It's a really simple thing that anyone can do. And it, it will guarantee you um, put, a, put a smile on your face because it just really ups your mental wellness and everyone just reports that they just feel so incredibly happy after being involved in helping to start that new life. Good for you. Thank you so much, Susan. Wow, it's so great to hear that action happens in communities at all different levels. Now let's hear from some other community members about solutions they're working on. Like myself, Dr. Shannon Waters is a public health and preventive medicine specialist and is the medical health officer for the Cowichan Valley region on Vancouver Island. Shannon is also an indigenous woman of Hulkaminam ancestry from the Tsuminas First Nation, who works to bring a voice not only to the health of her community, but to Mother Earth. Canada's indigenous people, who make up about 6% of the population in the province of BC, have lived here for generations upon generations whereas settlers from Europe and elsewhere have only been in the province for a couple of hundred years. Only recently has Canada acknowledged its role as part of colonization and the injustices it has visited upon Canada's first peoples. And Canada has now committed to reconciliation. As stewards of the lands and waters for millennia, indigenous voices are indispensable. Shannon, I heard you say recently that we need to recognize nature as the foundation for our health system but also that for indigenous people, sovereignty is sustainability. Can you explain what you mean, please? When people consider the health system, I think a lot of people think of acute care services, such as visiting their physician, going to the hospital, going to counseling, or perhaps receiving prescription medications. But as an indigenous woman, I consider the health system much broader than that. All the things that help keep us well in the first place, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And my Indigenous teachings, as well as a growing body of Western academic literature, are showing that connection to nature is a big factor in forming health and well-being. As shown in this slide here, in the yellow ring, uh, the wisdom, relationships, responsibility, and um, respect are not only things to consider in terms of our family, community, and nations, but also with regards to the land. So that connection, that relationship with the land is critical to our health and well-being. I think this has been demonstrated for us all in this time of COVID-19, where our in-person human connection has been limited due to help trying to decrease um, disease transmission. And so therefore that connection to nature is even more important. But we also need to recognize that nature as the basis of our health system is under threat through climate change and biodiversity collapse. A key important method to address this is to find ways in our work to support indigenous sovereignty as it values that connection to land as critical to health. And also because indigenous sovereignty through means such as uh, ownership, control, management, or co-governance has been found by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services to be an effective way to safeguard nature, which is relevant to broader society and especially critical in this time of climate change and biodiversity collapse. 
Helen Boyd is a registered nurse and mental health therapist who is passionately committed to conserving and enriching our environment for generations to come. She is the founder and coordinator of the Comox Valley Nurses for Health and the Environment. Welcome, Helen, and tell us, what are you doing there on the northern part of Vancouver Island? Well, we are on the unceded territory of the Comox First Nations, and we are very busy addressing both the health of our people and planet. And so to that end, we started this group in 2018, and it has a three-pronged approach. We look at increasing awareness about environmental issues. We look at taking concrete action and also about doing advocacy for policy changes. So a good example of that is one of the solutions to addressing climate change is the electrification of transportation. So in May of 2019, we decided to hold the first electric vehicle event in the Comox Valley. And we had anticipated maybe 300 people would come and instead 1,400 people attended. And what's really heartwarming is the results of that from ICBC, we learned from their statistics that in the Comox Valley, the increase in EV ownership went up by 267% in 2019. Wow. So, yeah, a usually successful event that again looks at addressing air pollution and bringing down greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere. So we were delighted with that. We are also sitting on the Airshed Roundtable that our regional district um, has started. And the reason for starting that is that we have a, quite a serious problem with air pollution in the valley. We live in a valley which has inversions and the smoke, wood smoke especially, is um, the main contributor to our air pollution as well as open burning. So this airshed is looking at what kinds of solutions, bylaws could be changed. Do we encourage people to go to cleaner heating, such as heat pumps instead? Do we uh, do more composting available for rural areas so that there isn't any open burning? So that's been one of our priorities is about air pollution and addressing it. And what about single use plastics? I understand you're involved with that too. Yes, yes. Our group was the one that went forth to all of the, each of the municipalities, we have three, and the regional district, asking for a ban on single-use plastics. And much like the city of Victoria, we were successful at getting those bylaws through, but the plastic industry challenged that. And where we are right now is with COVID-19, there's no ministerial people to give um, basically the municipalities permission to go ahead with this bylaw. So we're on uh, hold for the moment, but we hope that within the next two or six months that will be revised. So that's another thing that we've worked on. Great. And how does hospital waste figure into the zero waste picture here? So just before COVID struck, we were just about to initiate a green team at the hospital because as nurses, we're very concerned about hospital waste and um, the use of plastics and contamination of recyclable. And hospitals actually contribute a great deal uh, to waste. And so Again, something that's on hold, but that we plan to revisit with um, our hospital team is the, the start of a, a green team such as this. The Comox Valley Nurses for Health and the Environment were also part of the big umbrella Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment. We are uh, working in conjunction with CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And Dr. Trevor Hancock sometimes has given lectures here in the Comox Valley on planetary health and is a wonderful ally to us. So we're trying to create a coalition of healthcare providers who are also very concerned about planetary health. So what I'm hearing is everyone should be looking at their networks and finding out how they can get involved, get everyone involved in their network in one form or another. Absolutely. Absolutely. We always say in our group that the act action is the antidote to despair. And uh, that's why we're just so committed to doing this and to addressing one issue at a time, because we know that the health of the planet is inextricably linked to the health of our of our citizens. So in terms of banning single use plastics, people are not aware that plastic is actually contained in the filter of cigarettes. So two summers ago, we decided to run a campaign called Hold On To Your Butt. And we were very fortunate to have the help of Surfrider Victoria in uh, helping us promote this program. And what we did is we took four different beaches in the Comox Valley and we installed just cans for people to extinguish their cigarettes 
because of course, if cigarette butts go into the ocean, they leach toxic uh, chemicals to the fish, they pollute the waterways. But more importantly, what we did is we collected the cigarette butts that are recyclable because the plastic is extracted from them, from a company in Toronto called TerraCycle, and then they're repurposed into picnic tables and other different materials. So that was a, an example of a circular economy, like not one that we promote for people to smoke as, hell, as nurses, but certainly we were looking at water pollution. And that was our premise for addressing this and educating the public. So Surfrider Victoria provided us with these little um, portable um, ashtrays that we could give out to people so that they would learn to extinguish their cigarette and bring it home instead of throwing it on the beaches. And that was a very successful program. And it really spoke to the advocacy of we need more places for people to extinguish their cigarettes. We write briefing notes for elected officials. So when we had our municipal elections, what we did is we wrote briefing notes to the candidates and asked them, where do you stand on this issue? So at that time, we were trying to start the ban on single use plastics. So all the municipal candidates that were running, we asked them that. So now, typically, we would write up a briefing note again before these elections in that for us, our whole valley declared a climate change emergency, a climate change crisis is the wording here in the valley. So we wrote a briefing note about the importance of doing that as a community. And so we went to, again, each of the municipalities and sent to those letters and that was adopted. So we do that piece as well. Like I said before, the three prongs are the awareness, the action and the advocacy. Thank you so much, Helen. I appreciate everything you're doing and I'm sure our listeners do too. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Meg Holden is a professor in the Simon Fraser University Urban Studies Program, which prepares its graduates to generate new solutions for a climate-changed world. Her desire to stand up and take action on the climate crisis in our communities was kindled by David Suzuki when he spoke to her high school graduating class in 1992, and he pointed to both science and love as reasons to get involved. One of her goals is to encourage a net zero model building code commitment at the federal level, a commitment which the city of Vancouver and many other lower mainland municipalities have made. Greetings. I am beaming into you um, the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations in this beautiful but little bit smoky city that we call Vancouver where in the past two weeks, just a few kilometers away in the strait, two beautiful baby orcas have been born. I'm raising two children here, and in my working life as the director of the Urban Studies Program at Simon Fraser University, and together with my students and colleagues, we're looking for ways to make a carbon positive impression in the choices that we make in our lives and our actions, and to turn our thinking about cities as being part of the solution to the climate crisis and to the crisis of carbon concentration, more specifically. We have to learn to live differently. And although it's not as simple as the global search for a vaccine, the good news is if we can find ways to do this in our cities, we can actually live better in moving towards this carbon neutral urban future. The global atmosphere today has more carbon in it than at any time in human history. And in fact, research is showing that it has more carbon in it than at any time in the past three million years. All the evidence that I've seen points to some very cruel times ahead if we don't stop putting more carbon into the atmosphere. I could show you pictures how cruel this could be, but I really don't think we need to see any more of these kinds of pictures. I really think that we don't need to go there and that we are ready for solutions and want to hear the constructive way out of this situation in which we find ourselves today. So for me, that solution comes in the built environment of our cities. The built environment of our cities, the buildings, as well as the roads, the sidewalks, the infrastructure, contribute 
of our greenhouse gas budget. And believe it or not, it's not even technically challenging to reduce that down to a tiny fraction of that percentage. Engineers and builders working in this region today know how to build the structures that we need for the future and for a climate-proof future that produce and operate on very little carbon. And our authorities know how to regulate that kind of practice. I could make an ethical argument about why we need to move in this direction, but I don't even have to, because it would actually be illegal for us not to move in this direction. How can I say that? Because in 2017, the province of British Columbia passed a new approach to regulating buildings in our built environment called the BC Step Code. And it's calling on local governments that regulate the actual um, codes by which we develop and, and negotiate with developers for how they will be developed to take on increasing steps up that progressive step ladder towards building that will be net carbon neutral by 2032 and that's just in 12 years time at the highest rung of the step code and by ensuring that our municipal governments and our developers climb that step climb those steps that means that by 2032 buildings that are not carbon neutral will technically be illegal and that means a great new future for our communities in British Columbia as we start to stand up to the climate challenge as the global crisis that it is. I find this to be a particularly productive direction to move because it's more than setting ambitious goals and targets. It's actually showing builders, developers, and regulators the steps that we need to take in order to get there. Cities are the places where throughout human history we have always come because of the possibility of doing things together in our diversity that we never could have conceived of doing working alone or in our family groups. So I call on you now to be aware of the potential in our cities in British Columbia as you decide how you can make your own precious contribution to Drawdown. Thank you. Meet Paul and Naren, the creators of the Zero Waste Emporium, Vancouver Island's first zero waste grocery store that is completely package free. Their efforts have resulted in the massive reduction of containers, plastics, and packaging going to landfill, an estimated 60,000 containers a year. These two former biologists have seen firsthand what garbage is doing to our oceans and are an award-winning example of what's possible when passion meets action. Now, I interviewed you both just weeks before you opened in 2018, and it's been about two years now. So tell us, how have you managed to survive and thrive during these challenging times? Tell us what you do. Well, uh, from the beginning, we started with the ethos that we could all live a more sustainable life by following the six R's uh, kind of philosophy, um, starting with refusal, right? So refusing all the single use plastics and single use items um, all the way from the consumer to the supplier. We've managed to convince a lot of our suppliers to start reusing containers uh, and bring all of their products to us completely package free, right? And that model has kind of expanded quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, people are a lot more eager to start reducing their waste. And that has kept us going throughout this whole pandemic. There's so many people that have been living at home kind of with their own waste and realizing what impact they're having that we've had a lot of new customers come in over the last few months trying to reduce their waste and that has kept us going. Yeah, and as a business and personally, um, if you see a challenge as an opportunity for growth, um, then it becomes um, fun and not, uh, not such a chore to overcome these, uh, these adversities in life. In these times of COVID, it seems like packaging is what we're seeing more of rather than less of as everybody is getting hypervigilant about over packaging everything. And in your case, you're doing away with packaging. How does that fit within COVID protocols? So when we first set up the store, we set it up successfully so that all these protocols were already put in place because it's a brand new business model um, and we had a lot to prove. We had to show everybody that from the start, we could be completely uh, on par with all the safety protocols that were required for uh, this day and age. 
Yeah, and so what we've set up uh, during COVID times is uh, we provide containers for customers to use and refill. And so we sanitize containers in house, they have a deposit and people, when they return their clean and dry containers, they get their deposit back. So we can keep that circular economy going where there is no extra packaging being produced. We're just reusing packaging and sanitizing it in between, right? So we're, we're providing glass jars, which is sustainable and they can last for years and years and years, right? And still maintain those cleanliness and clean, clean and sanitize containers and those protocols throughout um, this whole pandemic. And how wonderful that you can find suppliers that are willing to do this. Now, those must be very special people and they must be very happy that they don't have to provide all that packaging. Absolutely. It's a lot easier for them. It's a lot less labor and a lot less money being spent in packaging. And um, to be honest, the majority of suppliers that we've contacted have been quite excited about the idea of switching to a model where they can provide containers that can be reused and sanitized again um, and just kind of change their business model, not just for us, but for their own customers as well. So have you any advice for people wanting to reduce their waste? Yeah, starting with uh, refusal. Refuse all the items that you can't use and reducing your consumption as well. We don't need as many items as we've been taught are taught that we need right and so reducing our consumption uh, will allow you to buy things that are high quality um, that will last you a lot longer and things that you can reuse constantly right so um, you'll have they'll have a much longer life cycle as well yeah so reducing your waste the best way to do it is to start with things that don't change your daily habits so switching over to a bamboo toothbrush you still brush your teeth the same way but the environmental impact of that is measurable um, when something like that can return to the earth rather than sitting in the landfill for uh, a couple thousand years. So changing your daily habits is not necessary in order to reduce your waste. Thank you so much for everything you're doing to be zero waste. And I love your Emporium. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Oh, thanks to those great speakers. Now we want you all to think about what's next for you. One thing you could do is go to Project Drawdown's website at drawdown.org and read about the 100 solutions in the Drawdown Review. Choose something that calls to you and get started. You can watch the introduction to Drawdown at pachamama.org and discover the grounded optimism that we can actually reverse global warming. Then go to BC Drawdown and join one of our five session getting into action classes to find collaborators. And you can watch some of the many videos on creativelyunited.org, which offers so many ideas about how you can get involved locally and see our solutions guide with 58 solutions to lighter and healthier living. And please contact your elected officials with some of the letters to politicians that we offer to support green policies. Before we conclude with a wonderful youth panel, imagine a community where the inhabitants not only install, but benefit daily from the sun power of solar, harvest food year round in solar powered and heated greenhouses, plus ship specialized crops all over the world. One of Canada's leading examples of this type of community autonomy has been in existence since 2008. The Souk Nation, a small community on the west coast of Vancouver Island, began its journey to become a sustainable community in 2008 with a comprehensive community planning process that involved everyone, including children. The guiding principles for the planning were based on seven generations, which involves planning 100 plus years ahead. Four priorities emerged from their planning, energy security, food security, a cultural renaissance, and economic self-sufficiency. The South Nation realized that in order to achieve true sustainability, it needed to embrace traditional values, including deep respect for Mother Earth. Welcome, Chief Planus. We are honored to have you share with us today. My name is Chief Gordon Planis. I've uh, been chief of the South Nation for over 10 years. And uh, my traditional name is Hayakwacha. I'm named after my great grandfather from Chianoch, the Salmon people. Uh, I live in the village of Sayosun, overlooking the Northern Straits of the Salish Sea. And uh, uh, my, my great grandfather owned the uh, fish trap in the front of the village here. And it fed our people for hundreds and hundreds of years through, through different hereditary chief systems. 
and we were able to use the resource that was uh, renewable. And when I talk about that, uh, you have to look at renewable energy in so many different ways. Uh, did you know that salmon's a renewable energy? And I don't think people ever thought about that. Um, we use salmon in a way that um, to that some people don't understand is that we used it to feed our people and then we shared it with all all living things and uh, we were able to be able to use a resource that defined us of who we are and also at the same time it protected us because we knew that if if we were in in uh, a place that that did really good work for our children and bringing them up in a good way that we knew we found a good way of life. And I think that is a big part of who we are is to think about the resources we have within our territory, how to use them in a good way. And the re how do you return that bounty so it can go full circle? And that, when I talk about renewable energy, when it comes to salmon, uh, I, what I meant by that is the, the salmon come back every year and they always replenished. And then they always gave us that gift of uh, being able to pass on the teachings to our children and our children not born yet, but at the same time, uh, be able to understand what a balance really is and if you live in that balance you learn more about the balance i think what's happened today is we've we fall we fell out of balance so in saying that we're not really privy on how we get back to the balance and the creator works in mysterious ways mother nature mother earth they it needs our help and I think we just need to help it along. And uh, we need to start going the other way. In the last 100 plus years, we've been in a world of resource extraction. And I think if we go back to a world of enhancement, uh, it's consistent with the values of our Coast Salish ancestors, that you're always enhancing it instead of going the other way. So when you look at the projects we did, uh, in regards to renewable energy in the solar. Uh, I like what our elders said and our people brought forward in our gatherings and talking about the future, and that is uh, we did it for our children. So when we talk about um, an alternative energy project that, that actually was able to use it as a, as a teacher, and, and, and of course, when we say about our children, it's a, it's a teacher for our children. But at the same time, I think, I think we can all look at something and learn from it. Doesn't matter if you're little children or adults or whoever. So when we talk about the solar, we talk about how we can uh, change the way we do things at home. And I think that was a good part of the project itself is changing the way we, we uh, live our lives every day. And I think that is one of the most important components of the project we did. It's not about the solar panels. It's not about the battery storage. It's not about, you know, uh, you know you're gonna have some science mixed in with traditional knowledge. It's about being able to look at it think about it and change. And if you do look at that change, how can we evolve? The way we see it is we're not going fast enough. And I think that's a good lesson learned is that if we're doing it and we were the biggest solar project at the time over 12 years ago, I think we got a problem. But in the last 12 years, I can say there's been a, a lot of good projects done in, in First Nations communities. I just see it not only in First Nations, but around where, 
where we're all learning. We're all trying to find that place that can, uh, that can bring us to that next level of the environment. We are going to unite as Canadians coming together to say, hey, uh, it's time to take a look at what we have and take a look at where we want to go and how we're going to get there and how long is it going to take us to get there and really look at it realistically and say, well, I don't like that. I want to cut that timing in half. So if anything, I think Canadians have to make an investment. And if you're going to do it, just think about your children. It's easier to make a decision when you think about your children. Whatever we do in, in the future in our territory with our people, we invest in the environment. And if you invest in the environment, you're taking care of the children. So um, I just see this as an opportunity. If you invest in the environment, you invest in yourself. And then also with climate change and everything else, how do we, how do we stay ahead of it? And, uh, you know, you always think about your watersheds, you know, our smokehouse lakes up in the mountains, our hunting grounds, our gathering places, uh, you know, the roots, shoots, and berries. Um, everybody sees the forest as, you know, if you look at BC in itself, all you have to do is look at a map. Take a look at a map from uh, 80,000 feet and take a look on the Vancouver Island in BC and look at how, how it's been uh, logged. And I, you, I'm not taken away from the jobs and the logging. I think we need to strike that balance on how we – we do things here because we got to start thinking about enhancement. We need to invest in the forests uh, because there are food forests. If we don't do that, you're not investing in the future and you're not investing in your children. So we just see it as a balance. And I think anything we do, it's, it's, it's around food security. It's around um, looking at the full food sovereignty compared to food security. So our territory has always been our, our pharmacy, always been a place for food. And we've always used every single piece of it. And, and now all of that's changed. You gotta make sure you got good water, good clean air, and you always put something away for the future. And if you do that, You'll do exactly the way our ancestors told us to do is that you look 100 years ahead. And if you follow that script, you'll do really well. But we haven't followed that script, and we need to get back to that. We all have a lot of work to do. We have a place that is beautiful, and we need to keep it like that. We need to think that today you have good drinking water that you can, you can uh, um, cherish, but do we cherish it enough? Do we, uh, how much do we invest in ourselves? And when I say those words, in ourselves, that means how much do we invest in the environment? Because that's what you're doing. If you go out and, and you raise a family and you get a mortgage for your home and you you want to, your children to grow up in a good environment and also go to good schools and be able to them raise a family, then that means you're not going to do it without a good environment. If we're going to do that, we need to all do it. We all have to be able to work together in a way that we can ensure that in a hundred years from now, your great, great children grandchildren are going to be in good shape. That is a legacy that Canadians can do. Legacy is something that we don't talk about enough. But when, when I was born, I was born with a birthright. I was born with a responsibility. I was, and that responsibility is handed down to every generation. And that is, is you got to think about the babies that aren't born yet. And you got to ensure that they have a good place to live. And I think uh, we all have to do that. Today, we all have to do it. 
And I think if we did, we would invest in ourselves. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Planus. As Chief Planus reminds us, it's the generations to come that will be most affected. And young people have been waking us up, insisting that we face the climate crisis and quickly act to turn it around. They're also working for the social justice that needs to be part of this healing of our planet and society. When Greta Thunberg was in Vancouver, these young people launched a lawsuit against the federal government defending their right to a just future. And now we would like to introduce you to our youth panel, moderated by Udeshi Sinivaratni. Udeshi grew up in Ho Chi Minh City and is half Sri Lankan and half Vietnamese. Her early exposure to integrated cultures influenced her learning about the effects of climate change on small communities. After earning her undergrad degrees in journalism and communication in New York, she came to Vancouver to get an MBA. Udeshi is a passionate advocate for climate justice. Udeshi will introduce our panel of amazing youth activists working to create a brighter future for themselves and forward for seven generations and beyond. Thank you, Sandy and Jim, for the lovely introduction. My name is Udeshi, currently working, living, and playing on the unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh traditional territory. Today, our seven generations uh, and, pa and beyond panel will include speeches from three incredibly talented youth climate activists, as you have seen uh, the pictures of them before. And so I'd first like to introduce uh, Katia Bannister. Katia Bannister is a 17-year-old youth climate activist and community organizer from Thetis Island, BC. She leads the Cowichan Valley Earth Guardians Crew, which is a group of youth from Cowichan Valley who strive to create meaningful change involving social and environmental issues. Katia is in grade 12 at Queen Margaret School in Duncan and plans to pursue a career in ethnoecology. She has a passion for restoration and conservation work, poetry, blogging, and is currently learning to speak the Halkameetan language. Her blog can be found at sowseedsofchange.wordpress.com. Next, I would like to also introduce Tavi Johnson, a 16-year-old climate activist from Deep Cove in North Vancouver. She organizes with Sustainability Teens and Climate Strike Canada. Currently, she's working on a project with Sustainability Teens about endorsing candidates from across the Lower Mainland in the provincial election. Recently, she was a key organizer in a protest held outside MP Environmental Minister of Canada, Jonathan Wilkinson's constituency office on September 25th, as youth across Canada stated that they were not going back to normal after the pandemic. And finally, last but not least, Jasmine Hatchie, a 16-year-old Métis climate and environmental activist. She is located on Vancouver Island and collaborates with many local and global environmental organizations to make meaningful change. She is passionate about indigenous justice, restoration, and event organizing. After high school, she plans to use her passion for indigenous justice to become an indigenous family support worker. I'm so excited to have you all here today. And um, I, I was just wondering if uh, I'm just going to address Katia first with her uh, amazing list of activism and accomplishments. Could you speak with us on some of your work with the Cowichan Valley Earth Guardians Crew and Dogwood's Vote 16 BC campaign? Just before I begin, huge thank you to you, Ideshi, for moderating um, to TEDx uh, BC Drawdown, Creatively United, and Climate and the Arts, all for collaborating to make this event possible. I am grateful for the efforts that have been made to invite youth into this space. So um, my work with the Cauchemelli Earth Guardians crew mainly centers on building community through education and action on social, climate, and environmental issues that have worldwide impacts but are felt deeply at that local level by my own community. And with CVEG, I mainly organize ecological restoration and bioremediation events. I promote permaculture uh, based urban design, urban farming, localizing food production, uh, and work with youth to create community art pieces and builds. And all this comes down to us with the future. And my group is youth led, but we have many, many intergenerational relationships and connections in our community, which makes the work that we do so very special. 
And um, with Dogwood's Vote 16 BC campaign, I work with a team of all other youth as well as a youthful staff of Dogwood members. And uh, we are campaigning to lower the voting age to 16 in BC. Thank you, Katia. And next, uh, to, for Tavi, could you speak more about your activism with sustainability? Yeah, I'd just like to first echo what Katia said. Like, thank you everyone so much for organizing this event. It is so incredibly important that we include youth voices and all these marginalized and oppressed communities when we're talking about climate justice. It's really, really important. And I'm so thankful that I have this opportunity. Uh, yeah, so I'm the regional coordinator for the North Shore Sustainability Teens and the official spokesperson, one of them. And yeah, so lately we've been working on endorsing candidates for the provincial election. So we've been handpicking candidates from the 39 ridings in the Lower Mainland that are young and progressive and really represent our values. The main idea is that we are tired of not being accurately represent, represented in the legislature. So we want to really design our candidates and push them to represent us and our beliefs. And that is why we are working so hard. We are actively volunteering for their campaigns and doing whatever we can to support them right now. Um, and yeah, we just finished organizing um, the September 25th Day of Action with the four different protests outside the different liberal MPs offices to protest this, um, this unjust system of normal that we called before the pandemic in our campaign called Not Back to Normal, which was incredibly successful. We gained a lot of media attention, especially from Jonathan Wilkinson as well. We heard his response and yeah, incredibly important that we stated that we were not going back after this pandemic. So big things are happening in sustainable teens. I'm so fa thankful for everyone I get to work with. There are hundreds of amazing people in that organization and it's just incredible to connect with these people every day. That's amazing, Davey. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, for Jasmine, it's so lovely to have your amazing activism experience with us today. Could you talk a bit about, about your meaningful indigenous justice and restoration work? Okay. Um, just want to say thank you so much for having me today and I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Kuwaitan people um, in the Couchin Valley. I've realized like as the youth climate justice movement has taken off around the world and in my community it has become more apparent to me as an indigenous woman and my non-indigenous activist peers that indigenous justice work is so intertwined, intertwined with climate justice and when I go out into my community and I do ecological restoration and remedition work um, on local watersheds and eelgrass planting and um, invasive species removal and I just remember that these lands have been cared for by um, the Quetzin or other surrounding um, indigenous groups of people for like since the time of memoriam and that's why it is important to do the ecological work that we're doing. Um, and um, just a few weeks ago, um, I actually worked with the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians crew to organize an art display um, in honor of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and residential school survivors. Um, and the indigenous children who did not survive the tortures of these schools. Um, this art display was a clothesline. We hung orange shirts in honor of um, residential school survivors and people who did not survive, and red dresses in memoriam of stolen indigenous women. Um, and I think that this type of work is just so essential to climate activism because of the just the history that they have, just the two intertwined so heavily. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That's incredible to hear you speak about the, that work. And um, for Katia, I just wanted to ask, um, what is the kind of support you need from older activists at the moment? So my, the support that I need 
from older activists is a call to action for all those in support of the youth who are campaigning for a better future right now. And my call to action is intergenerational collaboration. And I put that call out to anyone who considers themselves an activist and anyone who inhabits this earth in general. Intergenerational collaboration is about dismantling age-based stereotypes. It is about empowering youth to feel like their voices are important important and valued. And it is about making sure that youth voices are, um, that they go beyond being a checkbox on the list of inclusivity when people are trying to organize an event or any other example like that. It is about making sure that all perspectives are heard in decision making and as activists and as people, we need to be able to connect inclusively and effectively to be able to create this change that we are striving for. And intergenerational collaboration is key because it provides this strong foundation of supports, of knowledge, of passion, and of ideas for us to appreciate and, and build off of and be fueled by. And I need older activists to seek out youth, to make space for youth, just as was done so that we could be here today talking to all of you. And I need youth also to recognize their responsibility to do the same to create space. We all need to create space for one another. That was so beautiful, Katia. Thank you so much. Yes, and I completely agree with you. Um, and for Tavi, um, how do you imagine your future and how it could be? And what is the message you want adults to hear from you? Yeah, right now, what I'm trying to do and what everyone in Sustainability Teens is trying to do is to mobilize everyone who is able to vote to do so. Because we, as young people, are not officially represented in the legislature, right? The youngest MLA in BC right now is 35 years old. This is why we're pushing for 19 year olds and 21 year olds and even Kate O'Connor who just turned 18. People like that who are young and progressive and will fight for us and will represent our demands because they know how hard it is to be a young person in this time of a climate emergency, a social emergency, a global pandemic, you know? Growing up and in this time is incredibly difficult and we shouldn't be the ones bearing the burden of fighting the climate crisis as well and all of these social inequities we need leaders to actually take on the roles that they were designed to right and i imagine my future being so much brighter if all these leaders and politicians came together and along with everyone and represented the people and fought for the interests of the society right and not just for their own interests but actually represented people, fought for the people, and made the world a better place just because they had that moral duty, right? That's what I believe the future could look like. Thank you so much, Tavi. Yes, uh, definitely we need representation within the youth to address the issues that will directly affect us in the future, and I completely agree with you. And so for Jasmine, uh, last but not least, I would like to ask you about um, how do uh, what kind of support do you need uh, from adults at the moment? Uh, right now, from the support that we need from adults is that um, I think that this fits in quite well with what TV was saying, is that we need adults to go and vote for these young people. As of currently, we, we can advocate for them and we can do so much and we can volunteer and help them with their campaigns. We can go sign waving, but the reality is, is that we can't vote them in. And it is the responsibility of adults to go and make sure that these inclusive spaces are made for youth and to like push and get these people into governments because we need them there. Like it's, we aren't going to move forward and pass the climate crisis and get further on with our social justice movement and our climate justice movement without youth being included in our politics fully. Well, thank you so much, Jasmine. And uh, thank, honestly, thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing your incredible work and anecdotes today. It is, it is truly you who inspire me to do the work that I do too. And I really 
It's really so glad to have you here today. As a youth myself who has first-hand experience of climate pollution, um, air pollution, I just want to emphasize that the climate crisis is a nonpartisan issue. We, when we each take personal responsibility to address these climate issues, um, we are helping to stop the soon-to-be fatal causes stemmed from years of systemic failures and ignorance. And so we must all choose to speak up on the injustice of human rights and climate crisis, even when it's inconvenient to do so. And so thank you so much for all of your time today. And I hope that everyone listening were inspired by these wonderful youth's work. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Udeshi and Katya and Tavi and Jasmine. That was an awesome call to us, all the rest of us who need to support you. We need to support our climate. And you have made it very clear. At BC Drawdown, we are inspired by the bold vision of the Pachamama Alliance to bring forth an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on this planet. And we are creatively united with many other community organizations and individuals working to create the just and resilient communities we all want to live in. So that concludes our Countdown TEDx program. I have to point out that this beautiful poster was created by our panel moderator, Udeshi Saranvaratni. Please go to countdown.ted.com to see Al Gore, Prince William, Christiana Figueres, and many, many others who are creating the more beautiful world we all want to see. And thank you all for being with us tonight.